الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قالوا يا أبانا استغفر لنا ذنوبنا إنا كنا خاطئين قال سوف أستغفر لكم ربي إنه هو الغفور الرحيم فلما دخلوا على يوسف آوى إليه أبويه وقال دخلوا مصر إن شاء الله آمنين صدق الله العظيم Respected brothers and my dear young friends, <clears throat> the final topic that we spoke about last week was in regards to the concern parents should have for their children and their hereafter and their eternal future. And sadly, we see that there is we living in times where the near future and the dunya and the life above the earth is a cause of more concern for the parents than the life beneath the earth in the Qabr. <clears throat> and the question which remains after last week's discussion was how can we, how can we keep our children steadfast on deen and keep them close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? <clears throat> So there are a few points that come to mind and the first and foremost is dua. That parents should make sincere dua for their children, for their guidance and for their protection from fitness. Likewise, just like Ibn Masyad after he built the Kaaba and he turned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the first duas he made in the, which is mentioned in the Quran was where they call Ibrahim Rabbi Jalhad al-Balada Amina. That make this city a means of peace, tranquility. And protect me and my progeny, my children, from worshipping idols. Ulama say that why did he have to mention idols? And we are free from this. And so, out of the different answers, one answer is that that was the fitna of the time. That at the time, the greatest fitna and the greatest trial and the greatest guna was ascribing partners to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, Ibrahim salam practically mentioned the guna and practically sought refuge from it. Similarly, it is the parents' duty that the gunas that are rife, rife in our time, those that we know of, those that we see people engaged in, whether it be drugs, fornication, adultery. In fact, sadly to say, but turning away from Islam, irtidad, we should make a point of making dua. And making mention of these calamities and trials that, Ya Allah, protect my children from these gunas. And at the same time, we should also make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept them for the kidmat of deen. Accept them for deen, keep them steadfast in deen. Once our Hazrat Wala Muhammad Dua Sab mentioned a story that when his when the idea Islamic Dawa Academy was nearing to completion and the opening was going to take place, so Muhammad Dua Sab took his mother to give her a tour before everything was opened up. So he said, I took my mom inside and she was in Perda. And as we went inside, I was explaining to her that this is the atrium, the foyer area, when people come in, this is not part of the masjid, Jubio. So when I was mentioning to her, I saw her eyes swell up and fill up with tears. So I was a bit confused that this is a happy moment. This is a joyous moment that the Dawa Academy has come into existence, has become materialized, which was once a dream. So out rather than being happy, why is she crying for? So I asked her, okay, why are you crying bro? What's the thing that makes you cry? So she wiped her tears away and then she said, that years ago when you were small, 30, 40 years ago, when you were still a baby, 
One day at night, you woke up and you were crying. And you cried so much that I woke up and your father, as well as father of his duhats of Rahmatullahi, we both woke up. And it was in the midst of the night. And when we woke up and I was crying, meaning you were crying so much, your father told me that let's make dua for our son. Okay, Allah subhanahu is the middle of the night. And let's make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept him for some great kidmat of deen. And she says that I just feel that this is your, the dua materializing. So parents' dua is very effective. Parents' duas hit the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why parents should also make a habit of making dua. Allah subhanahu wa says, we will test you in good times, happy times, and also in difficult times. We tend to turn to Allah only in difficult times. When the son has now moved away from deen, now we, now we spend nights crying. What about the happy days when he was on deen? Why did we spend the nights then that Allah keep him steadfast on deen? Allah accept him for the kidmat of deen. So when they are young, in fact, in the Quran, the Quran is filled with guidance. Depends how much time and with what talab we look for. As Mawla Abu Lassan Nadwi Amtullah mentioned that the Quran is complete guidance. And when a person opens the Quran and he reads the Quran with this intention that Ya Allah, this book is complete guidance. So I want guidance from it. Then definitely Allah will guide him. So in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention and he brings a snippet of Hazrat Marim Alayhi mother. That before she was even born, the du'as are already started. So for our children, the first thing is parents' du'as. Parents should make a habit. Whether it's tahajjud time, whether they pray salatul hajjud daily, weekly, and give some special time for your children in terms of du'a. And ask Allah, beg Allah, that Allah keep these times of fitna. And seriously, there are ajib fitnas out there. That Allah protect my son from fitna, protect my daughter from fitna. Secondly, teach them to do dua themselves. Teach them the authentic duas of Huzus Rasul. Allah Mahdina wa Hadimina, Allah Mathabitna al Iman. Allah make us firm on Iman. And other duas that they know with the meaning, and when they raise their hands, they also make dua. It is mentioned about, I read something once, it is mentioned about Hazrat Abu Hanifa, that in his young age he used to make dua, Allahumma inna nasta'inuka ala ta'atiya. O Allah, grant me or grant us the ability to do your ita, to do your, be obedient to you. This is a dua in the young age, look what happens. We have people like Imam Hanifa, Number three is, we should make a point of taking our children in the company of the pious. The pious people, their company is very important. That's why Sufi in the Uyena, Rahmatullah, they used to say, in the dhikri salihin, tanziru rahmah. When the pious people are mentioned, then Rahmat descends. This is when pious people are mentioned, when the names are mentioned. Imagine you sit in the company of a pious person. What kind of Rahmat will come? And this is when a person, he will walk away with spiritual nourishment. We are also concerned about, about our body nourishment, of making sure that our body is in shape. We're getting the correct foods, we're getting the correct carbohydrates and the correct proteins. How often do we be concerned about the nourishment of our heart. Is my heart getting the correct nourishment? Is my heart getting the correct carbs and the correct fitness? And where does this fitness of the heart come? In the, in the company of the Salihin. And Muhammad Yunus Rahmatullah you say, Ma ra'itu anfa lil qalbi min dhikri salihin. I have not seen anything more beneficial to the heart than the mention of the pious. And who's the greatest pious person? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa so from Rasulullah to any pious person, you mention, inshallah, it will be food for the heart. And imagine you sit in the company of the pious. It will be nur al -alum. And this happens when we practically come in the company. Whether we understand what the person is saying or we don't. As, as far as we know that he's a pious person, he's from amongst the sulaha and amongst the pious servants of Allah SWT, come in his company and sit. Yes. So Hazrat Wala Dawud Rakat, when he came on Saturday, that's why he said, that whether you understand what Mufti Sahib mentions or he doesn't mention, whether you understand the Udu language or not, that is bonus. What we need is the sohbet, we need the company. 
And it is the company that shapes hearts. Depends whose company you are in, it will shape your heart. If you're in good company, your heart will shape in a good way. And if you take wrong company, then your heart will shape in the wrong way. That's why parents should themselves make a point of sitting in the majalis of deen, sitting by ulama, by sulaha, and at the same time encourage their children and tell them that there's benefit for you in there. There's benefit for your deen, there's benefit for your akhir in there. And then number four, the parents practically do what they say. If the parents say to their children, don't lie, then practically they shouldn't be lying. If the parents ban their children from not watching TV and YouTube, etc., then practically they should also be doing it. That's what I mentioned in the Quran. He is admonishing those people that say things that they don't act upon yourself. Because when a person does not act upon it himself, then the effects will not be there. That's why it's a story of Buzrug. But there was once a Buzrug, and a lady came from, a, from somewhere far away. And she knew that this person is a very pious person, Buzrug person. And this, this lady, her son, had a habit of eating sweets. All the time, sweets, things. And it was having an effect on his teeth, etc. But he wasn't listening to the mother. So the mother thought, okay, child, let me take him to a Buzrug, let me take him to a pious person. If he says one or two things, maybe it will have an effect on him, it will change his life. So the lady came and she brought him to the Buzrug's majlis and she said, okay, Hazrat, I bought my son, he's got a habit of eating sweet, sweet things, sweet meals all the time. He's having an effect on his teeth. I'm telling him he doesn't listen. You advise him. So Buzug looked and he said, Acha, Aisa karo, chandino ki barana. Come after a few days. Come after three, four days. So after three, four days, the lady came again. And she said, I came a few days ago and my son's got a habit of eating sweets. So Buzug sat the boy down. Peter, why are you, why are you eating these sweet meals and sweet things? It's not good for your teeth. Let's go to the Tell us all. He said these things. Why are you eating these things? Or something similar to this. And the lady went. So the disciples and the murids were sat by, they said, Gazette, if this is only what you're going to say, then you could have said it three days ago, because she came and she had to send her back and she came again. So what did the Buzuk say? Because I also have a habit of eating something sweet, gar, sugar cane, when it's dried up. So if I would have told him three days ago, because I have a habit of eating sweet myself, it would have no effect on him. So as soon as the lady went, I practically stopped myself. I stopped eating these sweet things for three days. And this is my third day, I've not eaten it. So now when I tell him, it will definitely have an effect on him. So his parents do it as well. That you practically do things, when your children see it, they will practice, they, they take lessons from the parents. Children. If they see the parents lie, they will lie. And they will in fact say, okay, you, you lied that day. When uh, the Jamaat Satis came and they asked, where is Papa? You said he's not a homo, he's just sat in the front room. So you lie, what about when you lie? So it is our duty that as parents, we don't lie. It is our duty as parents that we don't do anything adverse that they will pick up. Because the mother is the first school. Number five, make a habit of reading seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Talim in the house, etc. These things create shock, muhabbat, love, azmat in a child's heart. As Imam Ghazayamutullah Ali, I read some time ago, that he used to say at the age of seven, when the child gets some sort of understanding, the stories of Sahabas, their mujahadat, their, the trials they went through, the stories of Rasulullah should be mentioned to them, should be read to them. Why? Because at this age, tender age, their heart is very soft, uh, soft and they absorb anything. And they absorb everything. If at that time you talk about the importance of deen, Islam, how Islam came with such uh, sacrifices, then in that son's, in that child's heart, the azmat of deen will take root. Then the tree will start to grow. When, you have, when the love of Rasulullah comes in the heart, then the love of Allah automatically comes. Then to become obedient becomes very easy. Then to pray namaz becomes easy. From Moshe Vitaim Tula mentions that at a young age, Galima, at the age of 12, at the age of 12, I had a habit of praying tahajjud at the age of 12. At the age of 12. And he says this was the barakat of the company of the pious people. That I was lucky to have such pious people in the area that through their company at the age of 12, I already started being tortured. Imagine where he went afterwards. Where his life went to. So pious people's company, Sirat of the Sahabas, 
And this all starts from Yaqub As soon as he got sight, this was the last thing we talked about on, on last Wednesday, as soon as he gained his sight, you'd be asking 101 questions about anything. You'd be so happy. The first, one of the first questions he asked his son was, what's the state of Yusuf? So the son said, he's the king, he's a, he's a misr. So I'm not asking about his worldly status and his worldly gains. I'm asking you about his deen. What state have you left him in deen? She said, we have seen him. He's a very pious person following the deen of Ibn Salaam. This is the first and foremost figure. So, Allah SWT carries on with the story and he mentions that قَالُوا يَا بَانَ اسْتَغْفِرْ لَنَا ذُنُوبَنَا إِنَّا كُنَّا قَاتِلِينَ That the son said that, O oh, our father, seek forgiveness for us. For, for our sins. Meaning, seek forgiveness from Allah on our behalf for our sins. إِنَّا كُنَّا قَاتِلِينَ Indeed, we are wrongdoers. That the sons confessed. And before this, they confessed in front of Yusuf as Yusuf as and they said that we had made mistakes. Now they came to Yaqub and the whole secret and their plan had been exposed. He knew that Yusuf was not eaten by a wolf or anything. So they confessed. And they became humble in front of their father and they showed regret. And they sought forgiveness for their misdeed. And this is a lesson was that in life you make mistakes. Rasulullah said, Every person makes mistakes. But the best person is the one that seeks forgiveness. So whenever you come across a crisis in our life, whenever you fall into a sin, then the first step is have guilt and turn to Allah. This is the tariqah of the of, of Adam This is the tariqah of the pious. Not to become arrogant. Okay, it doesn't matter. This is the tariqah of shaitan. When shaitan was told about his guna, about his sin, that he did not prostrate to Adam Islam, then istakbara. Straight away he became arrogant. No, why do you have to prostrate to him? So we have two, two junctions. We have two ways. When you make a mistake, become humble and accept your mistake and have guilt in your heart. Or do the other and become arrogant. The first, you can become arrogant, but one day on the day of Qiyamat, your arrogance will be demolished. Your arrogance will be wiped out and you will be, you will be faced with the truth. And if a person becomes humble, then inshallah, and he seeks forgiveness, then he will on the day of Qiyamat have a foot to stand on inshallah. As Rasulullah well once mentioned in Hadith to a Sahaba, Ataduna Manil Muflis. Do you know who is the most bankrupt person? The Sahaba said, the person who has La Malalo wa la mata. The person who has no wealth, he has no money, he has no good, nothing. So I said, no, this is not the bankrupt person. The most bankrupt person is the person who will come on the day of Qiyamah be sawmin wa salatin wa zakatin. He will come with so much namaz, zakat, so heaps and heaps of good deeds. But he, he would have faltered in so many places. He would have not fulfilled the rights of so many people that slowly, slowly, they would all come to complain that Ya Allah, he did my gibbet. Ya Allah, he took a bit of my wealth. Allah, he slandered me. Allah, he done this to me. He wronged me in this way. He wronged me in this way. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will tell him to repay these people with his good deeds. So all the people that will be coming in, the, the only currency on that day is deeds. So we'll pay them, pay them, pay them, pay them, exhaust all his deeds until he will have nothing left. Still people will come. And they say, ya Allah, he wronged me in this way. He, he did not fulfill my right in this way. Allah, I was his neighbor and he done this to me. He swore at me, he pushed me, he hit me. He gave me taklif, he broke my heart. He taunted at me. But now he'll have no good deeds left. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will tell those people that will come that he can't pay you. So you offload your sins onto him. And he will come with a heap of sins now. So, whenever we make a mistake, what should we do? Say, turn to, turn to Allah. Do Tawbah. Do Istighfar. Have Nadamat. And Istighfar. And when a person does Istighfar, then he becomes clean again. So when he becomes clean again, now it is his duty to exercise Taqwa. Exercise Taqwa. Become Muttaki. Become pious. Fulfill the obedience of Allah. Fulfill the requisites. And fulfill the hukams. Now you live a life of Taqwa, Taqwa, Taqwa. And by chance, if you sleep again, you do something wrong. Then now you go on to the Toba platform. Do istighfar, Toba. Do istighfar and Toba. And if you do istighfar and Toba, then inshallah you'll become clean again and you'll go back onto the Taqwa platform. When a person lives a life, he should only live on two platforms either a platform of Taqwa or the platform of Toba. There shouldn't be a platform of Takabur and arrogance. Like when a person dies, then 
if he's on a platform of Toba and he's sought forgiveness, inshallah he'll be entering Jannah. And if a person dies and is on a platform of Taqwa, also he'll enter Jannah. So these are the two platforms that we have to stay on. If you make a mistake, Toba straight away. And once you've done Toba, then access Taqwa and become obedient. So anyway, Yaqub Salam, after they ask that for, uh, seek forgiveness, he says, Call us sofa astaghfirullahum, that I shall shortly seek forgiveness for you. Innahu wal ghafoor rahim. Verily, Allah is the most forgiving, most merciful. In Yusuf Salam's case, when they asked Yusuf Salam, straight away he said, Call Allah to three balaykum liyum. There is no reproach on you. I will not reprimand you. Alik, yaghfirullah lakum. May Allah forgive you. Yusuf Salam, forgive them straight away. Yaqub Salam said, Sofa astaghfirullah. Sofa in Arabic means shortly. After I pause, after a while, I will do toba for you. So we first he didn't say, how come Yaqub Salam delayed and he did not seek forgiveness instantly? We first he didn't say that there are many reasons that they have cited. And one is that Yaqub Salam realized that what they done was a guna which was connected with hukukul ibad, which was connected with makhluk. That they had fortified the rights of Yusuf They had put Yusuf in harm. So Allah, when somebody harms a makhluk, Allah will not forgive you until the makhluk has forgiven. If you have not fulfilled the rights of makhluk, you have, you have, you have, you have faulted and you have made mistakes in hukukul ibad, until that is not settled, Allah will not forgive you. So Yaqub knew that they had, the crime that they committed was against Yusuf Yusuf was the victim. But he did not know whether Yusuf had, asked, had forgiven him. So if Yusuf does not forgive them, then Yaqub asking for their forgiveness on his behalf is not sufficient. Because Yusuf has to forgive them first. So he said, I will shortly ask for forgiveness because he wanted to know, has Yusuf forgiven you or not? So after when he was told that yes, he, when the brother must have told him that yes, Yusuf has forgiven us and he said, La tathiba alaykum then he must have sought forgiveness on Nabiha. Other Mufassin say that Yaqub salam when he said that shortly I will seek forgiveness for you, it was because that he wanted to make dua for them at the time of the Hajjud. Because at the time of the Hajjud, it's a very blessed time and duas are readily accepted. Duas are instantly accepted. So, and that's why in the hadith he mentioned that at the time of tahajjud daily, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's special mercies come to the first guy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends with his special mercies. And at that time, the alan is made. Alami mustaghfirin faghfirala. Alami mustarzikin farzukala. Allah kada kada. Is there anybody who is seeking forgiveness that I can forgive him? Is there anybody that is asking for risk that I can give him sustenance? Is there anybody asking for maghfir that I can give him maghfir? Allah kada. How can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this alan till sahri time? Till dawn. Sadly, we are all busy sleeping and we miss the prime time. When the prime time is out, Allah subhanahu is there to give us. We are not there to ask. The point says, He is referring to Allah that we are ready, we are inclining, we are ready to give to you. There is what to ask. We are waiting to give you. We are, we are waiting to fill up your shoulders. We are ready, ready to fill up your pockets. We are ready to fill up your life with bliss. With happiness, what is there to ask? And sadly, the Mufti Shabbis have mentioned that one of, one of the reasons why this time is so blessed, Tahju time, is because at Tahju time, this is the time or the moment where least gunas take place on the earth. By Tahju time, the latter part of the night, by three o'clock, four o'clock, right now, Tahju time is about three o'clock. By three o'clock, the sinners have done their sins and have gone to sleep. The robbers, the thieves have done their robbery and they've gone to sleep. The people who are busy in fornication, zina, have done their zina and gone to sleep. The people who have engaged in drugs, they've done their drugs and they've gone to sleep. The people who are engaged in alcohol, they've had the alcohol and they've gone to sleep. And who wakes up at 3 o'clock? The Ahlullah. The awliya of Allah wake up at this time. And this day, same day, are begging to Allah. So at this time, Allah's special mercy is for them. And Shawalullah Dehri Yawmtullah mentions that those people who go to sleep with the firm intention of waking up at Tahajud, Allah will wake them up. Because when a person has firm intention of waking up at Tahajud, it is like a concern on his mind. And when a person has concern on his mind, he can't get proper sleep. Just like a person, he's wanting to go, he's got a journey in the morning, he's got a flight in the morning, at 4 o'clock, going to uh, Saudi Arabia, Makkah, Mukarramah. He will go to sleep at 11 o'clock, look at 12 o'clock, he'll still be awake. 1 o'clock, he'll sleep and he'll wake up. 
You look at that, oh, it's still one o'clock. Two o'clock, it's still two o'clock. Oh, it's still three o'clock. How come he doesn't go into a slumber like a usual day? Because he's got worry on his mind. You have to wake up for the airport. I've got to go. The same as Shawali Rahmatullah mentions, whoever goes to sleep with the correct niyat, with the firm intention that I am going to wake up for tahajjud, Allah will wake him up. Because I, when a person has this firm intention, he will not go into a slumber. Allah will not let him go into a very deep sleep. And remember, when you, go in, when you wake up for tahajjud, don't think you will miss out on your sleep. I read somewhere that this hadith of Rasulullah where he says, Ma naqasat malum. Ma naqasat sadaqa to me mal. That when a person gives sadaqa, he does not lose any wealth. Apparently, it looks like you've, you've given, you had a thousand pounds and you give 200 pounds in sadaqa. Apparently, it looks like you have lost 200 pounds. But in reality, you've not lost anything. In fact, the 800 pounds which is remaining, Allah will put so much barakat that you will be able to do things that you can't do with 2,000 pounds. And there are simple examples and it happens. That your roof is leaking and you all is giving your zakat, etc. Allah put barakat in your money. And a person comes and says, oh, don't worry, I'll fix it. And he takes 10 pounds and he's fixed and he stops leaking. And another person, his roof is leaking and he's spending hundreds upon hundreds of pounds. And his roof is not getting leaked. He's not getting fixed. This is a barakat of sadaqah. So somebody wrote underneath that just like sadaqa does not decrease your wealth, in the same way tahajjud does not decrease your sleep. The less amount of sleep that you had, you, you woke up one hour early for tahajjud, that one hour will not make you, will not make you exhausted, will not make you more fatigued. In fact, you will get rid of that exhaustion in the five hours prior. Yes, tahajjud will not have an effect on that. But Sadly, our nights, if we go to sleep very late, which is totally against the way of Islam, this was the way of the mushriks of Makkah. Because Saudi was, in Makkah was a hot, hot country, so at night it used to be really hot, so they couldn't go to sleep. So the mushriks of Makkah used to sit around the Kaaba and they used to talk and tell tales and tell stories right till late at night, and then they used to go to sleep. When Rasulullah came and Islam came, Rasulullah abolished this practice. He said, This is a wrong practice. This is a practice of the mushrik of Makkah. As for believers, we go to sleep straight after Isha. We go to sleep, sleep straight after Isha. As so Shawulullah Dehli mentions, that a person should pray Isha, and that should be a last thing, that you go sleep on naked on virtue. What happens? We don't go to sleep after Isha. We sit and we start talking. We go out with friends, and then we fall into such sins. Just lately, one person met me, and he was saying he's got a habit of a certain action. And I said to him, when does it happen? He said, after Isha, my friends pick me up and then we go and we do this certain action. I said, this is the problem. After Isha, you should be going to sleep. Go straight home. And in fact, some people don't physically do guna, but socially, on the social media, they are in such gunas, in such shameless acts, that a person, if you, somebody is to see, he will, he will not be able to face it. Certain acts, such acts on social media, on Instagram, on their phone. So what should we do? Make a habit. And as soon as I come out from Isha after, after Isha namaz, my mobile data and my Wi-Fi is off. That's it. No more Wi-Fi, no more data. Because this time after Isha, the mood is such that a person falls into guna. The mood is such that a person has ate, he's full, he feels energetic, and he falls in guna. Like whereas, the mood in the morning Fajr, you will never see a person do guna after Fajr. After Fajr, if he's working on Fajr, he will not go on his phone and start looking at immoral and uh, obscene things. The morning is not, the mizaj is not, the mood is not there. In the morning, the mood is of virtue. And at night, the mood is of guna. A person wants to do. Fornication happens, zina happens at night. Zina doesn't happen after Fajr. Chori happens at night, doesn't happen after Fajr. Give it at, in the morning. You want to give it, the person's not interested, he doesn't want to talk to you. But at night, there will be majalis upon majalis. Everyone sitting in the front room, in the living room, in the weddings, Aram in the tents. Give it upon give it till 2 o'clock in the morning. Why? That is the mood. So Rasul said, no. At, after Fajr, you should go to sleep. In fact, Rasul used to never talk to anybody. Only if it was very important issues, you would consult with Abu Bakr and Umar. Besides, besides that, the whole mizaj of the Sahabas was set and made that after Isha you go straight to sleep. Illa yeke you are doing talab ilm and you're reading kitabs or you're doing zikr and shagal. That's different. But besides that, we should make habit. And right now, youngsters, one of the biggest problems is, is after Isha. Whether it's the phone, talking, group chats, 
whether it's outside, physically, all the gunas happen. So anyway, as the Yaqub said, some of us in say that when he said this, he was referring to tahajjud time. That I will wake up for tahajjud. Why? Because at that time the duas are accepted very easily, readily, and this should be every parent's zeal and habit. That I'm not going to make dua any time during the day for my child. I'm going to wake up at the best time for my son. I need to give him the best time. I need to I need to prioritize. Not just making dua after I tell her, uh, after I finish eating, I've got two child salat hajjat. Yes, that's okay. But choose the best times. And some of us see and say that as the Yaqub said, when he said, so first of all, I will make dua for you, istighfar. He meant Friday night. This is what we call Jumirat. The night preceding the Friday. He meant this dua, this day, that I will make dua on this day because on this day duas are accepted very quickly. So he wanted to choose again the best time. And when you look in the hadith, as Abdullah bin Mas'ud mentions, that one day we were sat with Rasulullah as Ali radiallahu came. And he said to Rasulullah, that Ya Rasulullah, I try so hard to memorize the Quran, but it's becoming very difficult for me. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him, that shall I tell you something? The night preceding Friday, meaning Jumirat, at that night, in the latter part of the night, Wake up, Tahajjud, because at that time Allah's special mercies descend. Friday and Tahajjud time, double. At that time, pray two, four rakats namaz. In the first rakat, pray Surah Fatiha and pray Surah Yasin. In the second rakat, pray Surah Fatiha and pray Surah Dukhan. In the third rakat, pray Surah Fatiha and pray Surah Yifam Sajda. In the third rakat, pray Surah Fatiha and pray Surah Mulk. And then after that, make dua. And He gave him a specific dua to make. And praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with, with specific words of praise and glory. And do this for five or seven weeks. And let, let me know. As the early day Allah practice this. And in that, in that point, Rasulullah said that this is the time when Yaqub meaning this is the time when Yaqub made dua for his sons. So from this hadith, it shows that it was Friday. Yaqub must have been told during the day, must have been Wednesday, Thursday, Monday, Jubio, but he waited for Friday. As the earlier day says that I practice this. And as Abdullah ibn Abbas Ghaliban says, that five or seven weeks had passed. It wasn't five or seven Fridays that Hazrat Ali Radhiallah came in the company of Rasulullah and he said, Ya Rasulullah, sallam, before I could just about learn four ayats of the Quran. I could just about learn four ayats of the Quran, and before that I and after that I forget it. After this, I can daily learn 40 ayats of the Quran. And they are so strong in my mind, they are grounded in my heart, as though when I pray, as though the Quran is open in front of me. And before I couldn't learn a hadith, now the hadith I learned like this. The Friday, the Barakat of Friday. So on this, we understand. And then Allah Marazi Rahmatullahi, in his tafsir, he mentions that Yaqub said, look at this, look at the love in the children, in the heart of the father, that my children should not lose out in the Akhirat. He mentions that some say, that Yaqub carried on making dua every Friday in Tahajjud for how many years? For 20 consecutive years. For 20 years, he carried on making dua for his children. That Ya Allah, forgive my children, forgive my children, forgive my children. This should be the, the picker and the, the flame inside us. That we wake up in Tahajjud and make dua because the times are very difficult. The fitnas are outside, ajib fitnas. And if you don't have concern over our children, then they are going to slowly, they're going to move away. They're going to sail away. And then it's very difficult. Once they go out, then to bring them back is very difficult. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the correct understanding, grant us the tawfiq to act upon what's been mentioned. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us as well and give us the tawfiq to increase in amal. When we hear these things, we should make a habit. That's right. Lama, as Imam Ahmad in Rahmatullah used to mention, that I have never heard any hadith by active on it. When you hear something new, at that time the zeal to carry is the highest. It is 100%. You hear the importance of tahajjud. So to, if it's the first time you've heard it, today your zeal for tahajjud will be 20, 100%. So give your zeal some materialistic shape. Make a firm intent, I'm going to wake up for tahajjud. And wake up for tahajjud. When you wake up for tahajjud, make dua. Allah keep me steadfast on deen. And slowly try to improve our daily we should improve. As Abdullah ibn Masri say that man to Allah Shayn kanad me ala yawmi. I do not have regret and remorse over anything on any day more than that day 
that passes and my life decreases. Because every day that passes, that means your life is decreasing. If Allah has fixed that you have 300 days left of your life, every day that passes, that means that one day has passed, now you only have 299 days. Next day you have 298 days. He says, I do not have regret over anything more than a day when the sun sets, which means one day of my life has gone, but I have not increased in deeds. So yesterday I was still praying five, five namazis for us, today I'm still praying five. I've not increased, I've not prayed enough. Of yesterday I wasn't waking for Tajjud, today I'm not waking for Tajjud. Yesterday I was just praying a quarter para Quran, today I'm still praying quarter. This is not good. Daily we should try to improve. Yesterday I was praying a quarter, today I prayed one quarter and two ayats. This is improvement. Whether it's little or great, it's improvement. It's like a person that goes to gym, he will not stay stagnant on his 10 kilos of dumbbells. No, he will increase from 10 to 12, then 12 to 15, then 15 to 20. Why? He's bothered about his physical figure. He's bothered about his muscles. My dear brothers, we should also be bothered about our taqwa. And taqwa increase, increases to this. When you do good amal, the more good amal you do, the closer you get to Allah, the more taqwa in, in, increases in your heart. Thank <laughs> you.